happened. So years later, he calls me up, I'm still at Met, and he's talking about AIG. Now, in 2008, okay, ground zero for this financial catastrophe, everybody all stuck it on AIG. It wasn't all of its fault, but that's, that was the focal point. I said, Bob, what the hell would you want to do that for? And he wanted me to go. And I said, no way, man, I'll pass on this one, you know. And so, um, why AIG, Bob? So one of the principles he operated on, because he just wasn't an ideologue and wanted to save stuff, what he said was, you first have to have a sense of what's possible, a sense of what is possible. And so what he did is, because he met with Jim Milstein, Jim Milstein was the guy that the government appointed to run this rehabilitation thing, you know, because the, the government put up $182 billion, and, and, uh, 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 and, and, and that's it. And through Milstein, what he said was, there's a lot of value here. Now, this is a critical distinction, I think, because this is what business people really do, is they establish value. They create it, and they can identify it. And that's separate from bean counters, who have a tendency not to do that. They don't understand value, and they chase money. So Bob says, I think there's a lot of value here. And you know what? I think we can do this. And this guy Greenberg built a hell of a company. And um, I, can, I will take this job, but not to tear this company apart, but to build it up. So uh, it started the AIG saga. And the only way I can describe, which is in the book in detail, is the whole program was the first five minutes of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Did you ever see that movie? You know, the ball and then the, the, the spins and then the thing. That's what it was. It was unbelievable. The government was on his case. The regulators were on his case. Congress was on his case. Harvey Gollop was the, the CEO. Not the CEO. Bob was CEO, but they brought in, they brought in a, a, a chairman. And they did that because Bob said, I don't want to talk to the press. I've got to fix this thing. And I don't want to talk to those lunatics in, in Washington either. Get a front guy to do it, and I'll do the real stuff. So they brought Gallup on, and Gallup had the board, and what happened was he says the worst decision he ever made in his life because he was at odds with him and the board. There were factions of employees. AIG was run, they were all like separate tribes. So each one of the people running a big organization, and these were big, wanted to be their own CEO and do their own IPO and be a dude, and Bob would not let that happen. So you can imagine this stuff? And then the press beating the wine out of him. And then he had people in AIG sending them stuff to use against him, and one of it was good old Harvey, he, he thinks. So anyway, that's what he was dealing with. So the first thing he does is walk in. It's just like me with the first two weeks, he all of a sudden he makes a hard decision. You know, it would take a lot of people to do. He walks in and says, you know what? We ain't selling anything. What? They were already dismantling the company. And he says, we're not selling anything, and you know what? We aren't going to sell anything for the next three years. And they said, who the hell is this guy? What, is he crazy? You know, we got to do this. Ah, no, 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 we're not doing it. And, you know, you, you, you were fired, and you, you know, just boom, like that, you know. And, uh, uh, and, and everybody thought he was crazy. So the press is on him and everything like that. And then what happens is he has to get people paid. First of all, he, wa he wanted to get paid. And uh, he said, I think uh, $10 million, which is a mere pittance when you really think about it in terms of what they asked. He said, how about seven? He said, y you know. It's 10. And it wasn't so much that he needed the money, he was more making his position. And so he said, I have to get paid. And uh, the other, a sidelight to that is then, then, for those who don't know, he went to Dubrovnik. He had a dacha in Dubrovnik. And we did it, remember? We did a Payne Weber trip there in 86, and I'm with them. And he says, boy, I'm going to buy a place there. I said, Bob, this is Yugoslavia. What are you kidding? I mean, this was an incentive trip. And, and Brokus was saying, what's second place? Cleveland? What are you kidding me? Yugoslavia? You know, we flew out on Yacht Airlines. You know what? There's no first class seats in front. That's it, you know? And the, and the flight attendant would walk on your feet. So anyway, that was just a sideshow. So anyway, he built this beautiful place there. And he had already made commitments to go. And so he, he was there as a pain. He's a, he's a, He's at AIG for two weeks and then he goes. And then the press is all over, he's there, you know, summing it up and drinking, you know, and all this other stuff like that. But what, he, what, he, what Bob would always say is there is chaos, but I'm clearly in charge. And so that's what he would do. He'd test and he would impose his will, but for the right reasons. And so the first thing he did was he said, we're going to stop selling. Then the second thing, he goes to meet Geithner, who's the Treasury Secretary, right? So this is get to know you and what have you. So, Bob, in his inimitable style, who the hell are you to tell me that I can't pay my own people? 
I got to be able to pay these people. You guys lent me $182 billion. How the hell do you expect I'm going to pay it back unless I get people who are competent to do it? That's what I need, and you guys got to get off my back, and you got to fix it. I'm looking for a partner here, not someone who's going to check. So he's like this, like two inches from his face, kind of like, what the hell is this? And he's also a big dude, too. So he's like, oh, so everyone says, this guy's crazy, you know? So anyway, then Gallup was picking up on this, saying, yeah, this guy's a real lunatic. So he's, you know, doing a number on him, okay? But just like Payne Weber, what did he do when he got to AIG? He went out to the employees. He says, I can't believe the remarkable business you guys have built. And you guys are getting a raw deal. And you know what? I know what it's like. Do you know what it was like to be an AIG employee here? I don't know if we have any of you. But they were people threatening their children. It was horrible. And shame on you, shame on you. It was horrible. And Bob came out and he said, you guys are great. His, his goal was he wants to give the employees back their backbone. He said, you guys built a great institution and I'm behind you and I'm going to fight the crazies in Washington and all this other stuff. For the first time in a long time, they heard someone with a strong advocate. The other guy who ran it before, I forgot his name, Liddy, Congress just beat the wine out of him, and he would refuse to have that happen to him. And so what did he do? He gave them a vision. We can do this. He gave them hope that it's not hopeless. And he told them, you know, I really care about you guys, and I'm behind you. And he said this, if I have 100,000 employees behind me believing this, there's nothing we can't do. And see, that's a real leader. That's a real leader, not taking shots. And he was very critical of Obama and a lot of the politicians, because Obama was very, you know, set back, and he's anti-business anyway, and what the hell does he know? And, and, and one of the problems that they had was, uh, was uh, they, they said these bonuses, these aren't bonuses on Wall Street, people get paid more, they're at risk. They can pay it paid less, it should have been there. So they're saying, who are these people getting bonuses, taking pot shots, and he thought the president wasn't providing any leadership, and I agree with him. If you wanted to see a dichotomy of leadership, okay, Bob took responsibility for everything, and he didn't want, he wasn't, the, he was a smart guy, but he knew that there were a lot more smarter people and leveraged people. This president takes responsibility for nobody, for nothing, and uh, thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. All right, I'll get off now, okay. Get, get me, hold me back, hold me back. Okay, so anyway, uh, so now he did this, he had this in motion, now he had to convince the world. And perhaps a good microcosm of this is Congress and our very own Elizabeth Warren that advocate of the 1%, of which she lives like, but won't tell you. And uh, anyway, this is a little video of Bob now being brought in front of Congress. This was the same panel that beat the wine out of Liddy. We'll watch this, and so play the video now, please, if you would. To order, good morning, my name's Elizabeth Warren. The cost of AIG's mistakes were borne by the rest of us, the American taxpayers. Were it not for the commitment of the U.S. government at a time of great uncertainty, AIG would not be on the path it is today. I want to thank the government and the American taxpayer. Since receiving that support, AIG has worked in close coordination with the Federal Reserve and U.S. Treasury. We appreciate the constructive role that they have played. Chair Warren and members of the panel, I am confident that AIG is now on a clear path to repaying the taxpayers. The Congressional Budget Office says the taxpayers may lose $36 billion on AIG, and OMB says about $50 billion. Do you have a guess as to whether or not these numbers are anywhere near accurate, or can you see a larger or smaller number? You're still short of, short of what, you, what you need to, okay. to you know, cover a loss. Um, so in, in my view, it still seems like that will be difficult to, to, for the taxpayer to break even. Mr. Ben Moshe, I'm sort of interested in the contradiction or the contrast between your testimony, Mr. Gallant's testimony, and the testimony of Mr. Clark from S&P. Can you, A, explain to me your understanding of, of the difference between uh, your estimation of the, the company's earnings power going forward after your asset sales uh, and Mr. Gallant's? And can you explain to me your general how your general characterization of the of your company's financial position is consistent with s and p's view that absent government support your double b um, i i can't comment on mr gallant you'll have to get him to figure it out i know what i'm running i know the company i'm running and i have confidence in this company and i know what i'm talking about so you'll have to see whether he understands the company as well as i do you also said in your opening statement that you intended to pay back the taxpayers 
you didn't say I'm going to pay back everything but $5 billion or $50 billion. It sounded like the intent is to pay back everything. I believe that we will pay back all that we owe the U.S. government, and I believe at the end of the day the U.S. government will make an appropriate profit. He was also motivated by the fact that he felt that American capitalism should show the world that we can clean up our own stuff. And so that was some of the stuff that was there. And, and uh, uh, I have to tell you, you see the way that felt? Can you imagine being an AIG employee going through all of this mess and then seeing your boy on there on television handling that? It's the way he made them feel. And I had the privilege to work with him very closely for two decades. And, and a lot of you will never have that experience. The only way you get close to it is to buy this book.